that was wonderful, Roger, and uh, great news uh, for those in that industry. I hope, uh, <laughs> I hope, uh, I hope you take advantage of, of what Roger uh, uh, showed here. Our next speaker is uh, is uh, Alan Drake, and you know one of the things that we have to think about is not only what's happening as this perfect storm is hitting us, but how, uh, from an optimistic point of view, we we go forward. And one of the cities that got challenged as a result of Katrina is New Orleans. Well, Alan Drake uh, is in New Orleans right now. He's a former accountant, an engineer, and professional researcher, and uh, is working right now uh, in uh, public and transportation energy issues uh, in New Orleans. Uh, he's very active, uh, if you've read his uh, work on the oil drum. Uh, please welcome uh, Alan Drake. Why are y'all worried? I mean, you do know that it's entirely possible to operate a Western industrialized society, democracy, with essentially no oil, don't you? I think I see one or two doubting Thomases out there. And let me give you an example. After a six year, 100% oil embargo, they had gotten down their oil consumption to the point where the average Swiss used less oil in a year than the average American uses in a day today. Now, how do they do this? Shoe leather, trams. They, when everyone else was tearing theirs out in the 30s and they were expanding theirs. And electric railways running off of their own hydroelectric power. Now, many of you are going to say, well, that's wartime. That's not sustainable long term. And this is true. Oops, sorry. But if you go forward three years, peace had been in place, things had returned to normal, oil use had gone up by 800%, eightfold. Now, if we in the US could reduce our oil consumption to that of the Swiss of 1948, <laughs> Now, there are many reasons that I push electrified rail, both for inner city freight use and also for urban rail. Now, this is the primary one. There are environmental benefits, and there are also extreme efficiency, economic efficiency that comes from this. This trade is true basically straight up if you move a container by over an electrified railroad versus running it on a diesel-powered truck. For urban rail, the ratio is a little bit more complex, or the analysis is a little bit more complex. Just by having someone take light rail or a subway or so forth, instead of driving their car, you're going to get a 6 to 1, 8 to 1, maybe 10 to 1 gain. But urban rail promotes what's called transit-oriented development. This is where people move voluntarily into more energy efficient housing and urban forms. They walk to the grocery store. They bicycle to the post office. The postal delivery people do not have to burn nearly as much oil delivering their mail every day and so forth. So this is true, I think, more or less generically. Although I have to give a tiny bit of truth in PowerPoint, this is equally true. Uh, the numbers are a little fuzzy. One thing that I would have discovered in working with the Millennium Institute is the best economic policy is the best environmental policy. This is a profound truth. And what I want to, we used in all cases the ASPO Ireland uh, oil supply scenario and we used my electrified rail scenario plus a previous scenario that they had of a maximum push for renewable energy. And of all of these scenarios, this one was the best in every category. U.S. oil use was cut by 62 percent in 30 years. Greenhouse gases were cut in half. And we had the best economic results. The GDP increased by 50 percent. And that's a pretty good trifecta. Now, 
I want to give three examples of nations that have made po very positive strides towards creating non-oil transportation systems. And the first one is the Swiss. In 1998, there was a national vote to spend 31 billion Swiss francs over 20 years to improve their already excellent rail system. There were a variety of goals, but the major goal, the primary goal, was to get freight off of heavy trucks and on to Swiss rail. And if you adjust for population and currency, and I did this before the recent fall in the dollar, that's like the United States voting to spend $1 trillion on improving our rail system. So people that say there's no political support, well, not true everywhere. My other, second one is France. Everyone knows and has heard about the rather marvelous TGV system that they have developed of high-speed rail around France. They're still building more. It's still expanding. It's not done. But what they have today is not bad. They also have, and this is what many people don't know, is 10,000 rental bicycles in Paris with another 10,000 on order. But I'd like to spend a little bit more time on the in-between stage of a non-oil transportation system. They're trams. And sometimes it is easier to show how comprehensive their program is by what has not been done than what has been done. I looked at what, well, I'm sorry. This is what the French, let me say it there. How many French cities of 100,000 and more do not have a tram or plans for one? I took a list of all the French cities of 100,000 or more and went down the list. They are putting them everywhere. And they also know how to build them efficiently. We Americans need to learn to operate with the speed and the efficiency of the French bureaucrats. <laughs> One other example. Today, Houston has slightly more light rail, and I'm going to try to pronounce this properly, uh, Moulouse. France, a population 112,000. But because they have French bureaucrats running their system, by 2012, they will have more light rail than will Houston. Now I have one other example. It's a developing nation, roughly 100 million people. GNP, about roughly 4% of what the US has today. But what they, this nation has done is really impressive. In just 20 years, they have built subways in all of their largest cities, and they have built trams or streetcars in 500 cities and towns across, across this nation of 100 million. Maybe the French learned something. We did it before with coal, with mules, with sweat. We can do it again. <laughs>